Hello, everyone, um, and thank you so much uh, to the invitation from, from Kara and the, the IFLA SciTech uh, committee for the invitation to offer this webinar. Um, so uh, by brief introduction, I'm Tom Morell. I'm the research data specialist at Caltech Library. Um, so I manage our uh, data and software repository for Caltech. Um, and I help researchers across campus figure out the best places for their data to live and to help them with their data and software storage and sharing needs. Um, I'm also um, a certified software carpentry and data carpentry instructor. Um, and that's what I'll be sharing with you uh, today is what we, um, what we have in terms of the carpentry's general philosophy. And then we'll go specifically into author carpentry, which is something that I um, helped found and start. And we'll have lots of time to chat about that. I'm gonna start by dropping into the chat um, a link to my slides, which are on Zenodo. So I've got lots of links and stuff there um, that uh, you're feel free to, to grab instead of trying to copy down from the, from the Zoom. So now without any further ado, I will share my screen. I will attempt to uh, follow the chat, um, but um, there will also be time at the end for questions. Um, so you can drop stuff in chat during the talk um, and I'll try to address it immediately uh, or there will be time at the end. So either way, whichever you prefer. Um, cool, so let's go ahead and get started. So to begin with, what is the carpentries? Well, if you want a kind of one sentence, one phrase summary, it's researcher focused software and data instruction. So we're targeting specifically researchers um, and looking at data and software. Um, I want to start off by making clear that some of the text and images in this presentation are derived um, from the Carpentries website, and these are licensed uh, CC by, um, by the Carpentries. This is my presentation, um, so it's not endorsed by the Carpentries, it's not an official presentation, it's my uh, personal distillation of the Carpentries philosophy and author Carpentry. So I wanted to start with kind of the, the motivating question is, why do researchers need to know about software and data? Um, okay, so if we're gonna do instruction, why do we need to do this? Well, studies have shown that, that scientists are actually spending a large portion of their time writing software, maybe 35%. Um, but the vast majority don't have any formal training. It's not part of most standard degree programs. So they're kind of just making this up as they go along. That's not the most efficient way to get kind of high quality software developed and do the type of uh, reproducibility data analysis that we want to see. In addition, the volume of data that researchers can collect today um, and that they might need to use and do analysis on is greatly increasing. Um, you know, one example from microscopy, it, they've seen like a tenfold increase in the volume of data that they're generating over the last five years. So there's just a lot of data around and researchers need skills to be able to manage that effectively. Um, and why are we talking about kind of new curriculum and new instruction? Well, these are not traditionally integrated into the degree program. And it's very hard to kind of go in and adjust kind of degree programs for folks that are currently grad students, postdocs. So these, the, all this instruction is designed as add on additional workshops. There's special workshops to say here, we're gonna sit everybody down, get everyone who's interested into a room and teach you what you need to know about software or data management and data processing. So what's a bit of the history of the Carpentries? So it was founded in 1998 by, Brent, by Greg Wilson and Brent Gordo. Um, and they had the, the motivation that I just talked about, that there was a bunch of researchers um, at, uh, in this case, Los Alamos National Labs, that um, needed better software development skills. And so they came up with a curriculum, uh, the basic curriculum that's still used today of, these are kind of the, the, the skills you need to get started. These evolved over time in 2005, um, the lesson materials were made open source, available freely online with support from the Python Software Foundation. In 2012, they expanded further with funding from the Sloan Foundation and the Missoula Science Lab. Um, to generate really kind of a workshop structure and figure out, okay, how are we going to have an organization that can really steward these lessons and coordinate workshops 
um, for researchers around the world. And this includes researchers at libraries. Data Carpentry was founded in 2014 by a whole big group with support from the National Science Foundation to take the software development principles of these workshops um, and expand them out to specific discipline specific data processing needs. So ecology, genetics, um, geospatial data. So to really give researchers a specific pathway for, okay, you're in this, uh, you know, in this, you're working with this type of data. This is kind of the basic approach that you might want to use uh, for your data analysis, how to manage that data. Um, also in 2014, um, James Baker received support um, from the Software Sustainability Institute to implement library carpentry. That's very similar to data carpentry. It's the idea that um, librarians, library staff need um, software and data management skills. And so it's a set of lessons that are specifically designed for the types of data and the types of transformations um, that libraries need to do. Um, this has been scaled with additional funding. And in 2018, uh, software and data carpentries merged to form the carpentries. So they were previously two separate organizations. And then they decided, hey, it makes sense for us to actually be one centralized organization. Um, so that's how it is today. There's one centralized carpentries organization uh, that manages lots of different lessons, including the software carpentry lessons, the data carpentry lessons, and the library carpentry lessons. So that's where we are today. We've got um, a umbrella organization with different types of curricula underneath it. Um, well, why do we care about this? It's because it's had a really huge impact. On average, there's a carpentry workshop happening every single day somewhere around the world. So this, these workshops and lessons are really getting um, broadly used and broadly taught. So it's been 2,700 workshops over eight years. These are uh, around the world. You know, there is a higher uh, proportion of workshops in the US and Europe as well as Australia, um, but it is a worldwide um, this organization with worldwide scope. And the, the really encouraging thing is uh, Carpentry uses a lot of um, feedback on their workshops um, after action reports on how did the learners like the workshop. And overall, 93% of learners would recommend a Carpentry's workshop to their friend or colleague. So that's the, the, the promoter score. That, that's really, really, really high. So it shows that researchers are very much appreciating this type of targeted instruction. Um, so this is something that we want to, to, to work on. This is something we want to focus on. Okay, so what are, the, what's, what are some of the key parts of the carpentries? Well, one that's really beneficial and I think actually results in the carpentries having even a bigger impact than I showed in the last slide. The last slide only has workshops where they register with the main carpentries organization. However, all the curriculum is completely open online, um, which means that anybody can grab this curriculum and teach it. So, I suspect um, that it has much broader impact, much more workshops taught than the ones that are actually centrally registered. Um, so this includes some of the highlights, um, Shell for working with the command line. Um, another thing to point out is that most of these lessons are starting from scratch. So they're assuming that the learners coming in have never worked uh, on the command line on their computer before. And that's really important uh, from kind of an instructional philosophy perspective. We wanna make sure that researchers have a good experience um, with kind of the first time that they're learning about programming or working with software development. Um, if they come in and it's too hard, then they're going to get frustrated. And they're going to feel like, well, I, I just, I can't program. Programming is not for me. Um, and then we've kind of lost them forever. So it's really important that all these workshops are structured just without any prior assumptions. And we work really hard as um, instructors to make sure that we get everybody off and running, started to do a little bit of programming. You know, you're obviously not gonna learn how to do all of shell and bash scripting and Python um, in a workshop. But the hope is you'll get enough stuff started working on your own machine um, to be able to move forward and to feel like you've accomplished something. Um, there's workshops on Git, so version control and software, how best to keep track of changes in your software and sharing your software with other people. Um, Python for doing programming, data analysis, visualization, as well as R for doing visualization and programming in R. So these, there are uh, different programming language options that are available in the curriculum that can be selected. 
And then there's also the data carpentry lessons, which I, as I mentioned before, are specific to a given uh, field or subfield. So we've got the ecology Python lesson and the ecology R lesson as just an example. There's, I think, over a hundred different types of lessons that are available between software carpentry, uh, data carpentry, uh, library carpentry, and the, the carpentry incubator. So there's lots of lessons out there that are available. Um, and this is really nice because you can look and see what we're going to be teaching. We can give this out to learners to say, here's what we're going to be teaching. Somebody doesn't show up or is unavailable to come. We can say, this is what we taught. And you've got all the bits of code, all the explanations, and all the exercises. So these are really great resources. Um, if you just use them by themselves. They're all licensed CC BY, so you can go and use them and remix them um, as you like, assuming you give credit to where the source is. Um, so this is a really great resource. What other things are important to know about Carpenter's workshops? Um, a full workshop will cover an entire data analysis workflow. So uh, for a software Carpentry workshop, that'll be um, starting with shell, so working on the command line, and then working with Python programming, so actually writing up a program that'll do some data analysis, do some visualization, um, and then working with uh, Git for version control. Data carpentry um, has similar components. They can differ a little bit. Sometimes you'll do open refine for doing some data cleaning um, or using some other applications. Uh, but it, the, the idea is you give the learners um, basically kind of the basic tools and a workflow of, okay, this is how you would um, develop an application um, for doing data analysis for your research. Um, in person, um, the recommended format was kind of two days. So basically you get two intense days um, where people can come in, learn all they needed to go, and then go off and do their thing. Because one of the, the challenges with these workshops is, you know, if you do it for a long period of time, then people will drop off, they'll get busy, and they weren't able to come. So they kind of found that two days was a good structure for this. Um, now we're obviously doing stuff online because of the pandemic. Um, and that structure is more flexible. Um, so at least for us at Caltech, we found um, that folks certainly do not want to be on Zoom all day. Um, we've actually found that about an hour is a good amount of time for, for, for a workshop. So we basically take the existing carpentry curriculum and split it up over multiple days, over multiple weeks. Um, uh, and you know, it's not as nice as an in-person workshop, but uh, it's what we've got to do to keep everybody safe. Uh, so there's a little more flexibility in the online workshops. Um, what are some of the kind of highlights, important things to note about the workshop? So um, you have an instructor in the front of the room that's doing live coding. So basically typing on their computer, typing in the, the lines of computer code um, that's doing the data analysis. And then all the learners can follow along on their own computers typing as they go. Um, so this uh, gets everybody involved in um, you know, actually doing the work of uh, data analysis, actually doing the work of writing a, a software program. Um, even if it's guided, them actually typing it out makes them feel uh, more comfortable with the idea. So it's not just like a lecture and somebody saying, these are the concepts of programming. This is the best practices for doing data analysis. No, it's really like you are going to do some data analysis, even if it's with you know an example data set, um, even if you'd want to do different things, um, if you were doing this um, you know, in a real lab, it's, it's something that people can take away and say, yes, I actually did this. Um, it's important we always have co-instructors and helpers available um, because uh, one of the important things is we want to make sure that people don't get lost. So we always need to have enough people in the room that help somebody if they have you know, an issue installing a package on their computer or they're getting a weird error. Um, since we're running software on everybody's computers, we always get some sort of weird configuration error for somebody. Um, so having um, helpers and co-instructors in the room to assist is really critical. Um, on Zoom, uh, we can do this with um, helpers and co-instructors um, that are kind of labeled in the chat, and then people can directly chat them. We can pull people out to breakout, room, breakout rooms. Um, it's not as easy as doing it in person, but it is doable. Um, and in person, we use sticky notes on computers. So basically give everybody a, uh, you know, like a red and a blue post-it note or a red and a green post-it note. And when they, somebody is having a problem, they can put up, uh, say, the red post-it note on their computer, and then the helpers and instructors know that somebody needs some more detailed assistance. That helps make sure that everybody gets, um, doesn't fall behind and is uh, understanding the lesson. And sticky notes are also useful, like if you're doing exercises, you can say, okay, when you're done with this exercise, put a green sticky note up on the back of your computer. Um, so it's just a really quick, easy, cheap way of um, gaining feedback from a room. 
uh, in Zoom, this is a little bit harder to do because you've got to do kind of with the, the, um, you know, the, the, the participant responses or in the chat. Um, so, you know, it's harder to get feedback when you're doing it online, but it is possible. Um, and it's just something you need to really reinforce kind of throughout the workshop is checking in, okay, a few people need help. Uh, do we need to take things slower? Um, because, you know, you just can't get a feel of the room as easily when you're doing something on Zoom. Okay, um, another important part of the Carpentries is, is certified instructors. So every Carpentries workshop, something that's branded as an official workshop, um, needs at least one certified instructor. Um, the training is, itself is on the kind of instruction, the, the best practices and how the Carpentries curriculum is designed, um, how the workshops are run. It's not like a, a, la a class on how to do shell. It's, it's specifically training on instruction itself. Um, there's a checkout process where you go and actually work on some of the specific course content. Um, the training is typically virtual and uh, keeping with the Carpentries philosophy, the curriculum is available all online. Um, so you can go see what they teach. Um, Carpentries is a, is a nonprofit organization and it's a member organization. Um, so uh, members, and which include a lot of libraries, um, uh, provide funding to support the operation of the organization. And they get in exchange um, training opportunities uh, for their staff to become certified instructors, um, as well as workshop organizations. So um, if your organization wants to host a workshop, um, you can go to the main carpentry's organization and say, hey, I'd like to host a workshop. Can you help me find instructors? Can you help me with registration and logistics? Um, if you're not a member, there's a fee for that. Um, but if you are a member, that can, can be included in your membership. Um, so you provide support and you get benefits. Um, and they also have donations. So they're doing a, a giving campaign now. So if you like the organization, you can give directly. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of the Carpentries broadly. Um, now I wanna take um, the rest of our time today and talk specifically about author carpentry because this is something that's um, a bit newer and is not as well known um, because it, it's still smaller. It's still a growing uh, incubating effort. So what is Arthur Carpentry? Well, it's, it's an independent set of lessons. Um, it's not part of the main uh, Carpentries organization, um, but it's targeted specifically at open scholarship, scholarly identity, and more. And what was the motivation for, for coming up with a new type of Carpentry? Um, it was that, you know, in some way, the research paper hasn't really changed that much in 400 years. So if we look at the original uh, Royal Society Philosophical Transactions, um, you know, it was reporting, here's the research that we have done in printed format, nicely, nicely structured um, with maybe some illustrations, maybe some figures uh, that was then distributed to other side to announce a work um, to, uh, to create, you know, who was the original person that came up with this idea. Um, and that basically is what we're still doing today. Um, you know, we have researchers work on fine discoveries, they write up a publication, um, then they generate kind of a PDF, nicely formatted a publication with some graphics, some pictures, and lots of text, and then the journals distribute that. So it's kind of a, a static PDF that they can sent around. Now, there's been a lot of changes, obviously, in, in publishing, but the, the general structure is, is, is very much the same. So the thought was, you know, can we empower researchers to create something better, something more than just a, a static PDF of their work? So something that, that is easier, that involves kind of less futzing in Word and less kind of formatting, uh, something that, that's reusable. So the, the, the actual text, the, the figures, the images, um, that's something that, that can be reused for multiple contexts, multiple formats, and multiple individuals. And can we make something that's reproducible? So can we make it really easy for other researchers to understand exactly what types of data analysis somebody did? what types of work, what's the underlying support for the, the specific figure or the specific information in the paper. So this is kind of the motivation is, okay, how can we help researchers um, move their kind of publishing and authorship forward? So a bit of history, um, Gail Clement designed the author carpentry, des designed author carpentry in 2017, um, specifically to fill gaps in the, in the carpentry's curriculum. She's really the, she had the idea for this. This is really her concept. And she created a lot of the content and the structure um, that now forms Arthur Carpentry today. 
um, I helped with uh, the lesson framework, uh, as well as contributing to the instructional design. Um, Sebastian Karcher and a lot of other contributors um, helped create the individual lessons. And if you go to the individual lesson pages, which I'll show in a bit, you can click through and see who contributed uh, specifically to each lesson. Um, so a lot of folks worked to get us to where we are today uh, in terms of Arthur Carpentry. And the way that it's kind of structured, or we think about this, it's a complement to the existing Carpentry's curriculum. So we can look at kind of a, a traditional data Carpentry pipeline. Uh, for data analysis, right? So we've got data coming from a data source, and then it goes through a data validation process, working it into a nice, clean, tidy data set, uh, going on to some exploratory data analysis, maybe some plotting, and then actually doing some hypothesis testing and some serious analysis. And this is kind of what you'll get in a, in a standard workshop. So you'll go through this whole process, you'll start with some data, you'll work on it, you'll look at it, and you'll have, you know, probably not some actual real results, but, you know, in theory, you have some results at the end of it. What author carpentry does is it fills in the little gaps around this workflow. So, you know, specifically, where is that open data coming from? How do we get that? How do we look at it? How do we judge that? Um, what are the best practices for capturing and documenting how exactly one is doing the data analysis? How is the code working? What is the workflow to get the, the data file um, into this actual final output? And finally, this last bit at the end, which is kind of tacked on publication, right? So we've got some results. Now we're going to go over and put it into, into Word and drop it into PDF. So how can we have open authoring? Um, what do we need to know about peer review, attribution, licensing, dissemination, author identity, author reputation and impact? So there's lots of stuff in the, in the publishing world and in the authorship world that um, isn't in a kind of traditional carpentry's curriculum. So the question is, can we come up with uh, a set of lessons that kind of acts as an extension? There's some other differences that are worth pointing out. If you start looking at these lessons, um, one thing that you'll notice is that the lessons look a little bit different. And that's because Author Carpentry uses a, a simplified lesson template. So instead of the, the standard Carpentry's lesson template, we use something that's, that's easier. Um, if you care about the technical details, it's based on Pandoc and a lightweight parser card called MakePage. And the reason that we did this is because um, we wanted to make it really easy for individuals to be able to work on the lessons uh, locally on their own machines. So the Carpentry template is based on Jekyll, which is really kind of a pain to install on uh, new, new individuals' machines. Um, and matter of fact, uh, the Carpentries is actually working on this. Um, they've come up with their own uh, new version of the template um, that'll be based on Pandoc and using RStudio, which I'll also talk about in a little bit. Um, so I suspect at some point in the near future, we'll actually be migrating to um, what the Carpentries will be using on their new templates. So we're all going on the same page, but we, we started off with a simplified version a little bit early than they did. Um, and it's also specifically designed to integrate with existing Carpentries workshops. Um, so they're either kind of a one hour chunk that you can very easily tack on, um, or a little bit longer kind of five hour lesson that gives you a whole workflow. Um, so they're a little bit more flexible than, uh, uh, than a kind of traditional Carpentries workshop. Okay, so let's go into the, the specifics, what lessons um, are available today. Uh, the first thing that I wanna uh, again emphasize is that all these lessons are hand on, hands on and involve working through kind of specific relevant targeted examples that are that'll be uh, applicable to researchers. So even though some of these topics might sound kind of like it's gonna be somebody talking through a PowerPoint, um, you know, we have actual examples that researchers can do um, on their computers as they go through the workshop. And it's really important as part of the, the Carpentries framework is that by the end of the, the lesson that researchers can actually take something away that they can use daily in their research. So we have three active lessons that we've taught um, in uh, multiple times. Um, we have one that's on uh, persistent access to research outputs with digital object identifiers. Um, we've got one that's on scholarly identity with ORCID. And the third, which is our longer workshop on creating re re reproducible reports um, with our studio and our markdown. And I'll talk about these in much more detail in a little bit. We've also got a lesson in development, which is web publishing with GitHub and Jekyll. So it's basically GitHub pages. Um, that content is there, but we haven't really taught it a lot. So it's still, we have to kind of make sure that it still validates and works well for researchers. Okay, so where have we taught these? 
So we've taught these at the 2016 to 2019 uh, CODATA RDA Research Data Science Summer Schools uh, at the 2017 uh, Conference on Artificial Intelligence, the 2017 to 2019 Force 11 Scholarly Communications Institute, oh. and some standalone integrated workshops that we've done at Caltech. So we've piloted these both as just a kind of, you know, one hour drop-in instruction uh, type oh, workshops. Nice. And we've, uh, we've also, we've also, we've also included these as part of um, a traditional carpentries workshop. So we basically tacked on an extra chunk of uh, one of these workshops to a, uh, something that we're already working on. All righty. So we've tested the ones that ones that we're sharing in our public. We've made those available already, and we've we've tested and validated those. That they do really work with actual researchers. Okay, so what are in the the active lessons that we have? So we have one that's um, looking at kind of persistent access to digital object identifiers. Um, so we start off with just what exactly is a DOI? Why should researchers care about DOIs? What is their benefits? What role do they play on the, on the scholarly web? Um, we then get into the actual activities. So we use curl on the command line to retrieve DOI metadata to really bring home the fact that um, the value of the DOI is not just in the fact that it's a, a persistent identifier or a unique identifier for an object. Um, the real value is that it has metadata associated with it and it's in a standard format and you can get it and do things with it. Then we go to something that is really specific to what, what the benefits of having that metadata available is to actually get a citation and to be able to customize what type of citation format you get out. Um, so that's a really kind of useful thing for researchers to know that if they have a DOI, they can go very quickly and get a citation. We then look at the structure of the DOI. How, how is it organized? And we work out, okay, who owns it? Is it data site or Crossref? Um, that most of the scholarly DOIs come from them. And finally, we end with actually getting a DOI for your own scholarly content. So uh, the workshop uh, uses Zenodo as a, a open source for sharing scholarly content and obtaining DOIs, but you can easily swap in uh, your own institutional repository um, as appropriate. Okay, so that's the, the first one. This is a kind of one hour um, all encompassing workshop. Our next workshop is, or our next lesson set is uh, around ORCIDs. And it starts out with just the motivation. Why would a researcher uh, care about uh, ORCIDs? Why would they want one? What is the benefit to them? What is the benefit to the scholarly community, community broadly? What's the benefit to the society? We then go through, you know, starting from assuming that people don't have an ORCID or if they have one to, to go get it or to get, get password reset, and get access to it. Um, we go through the process of registering, populating your ORCID account, um, entering, um, research work, entering research contributions into the work section. Um, we go through kind of three different approaches you can do to get actual stuff into your ORCID profile. We go through kind of how you can manage permissions, emphasizing the, the real privacy benefits um, that ORCID has, managing stuff like duplicate records. Um, and then we go to the, the, the main benefit for researchers is um, making their lives easier in terms of filling out applications. So we use their ORCID account and complete an NIH or NSF biosketch in Science EV. So to show that, okay, even though you have to do some work to get your content into ORCID, um, you can then benefit by using that as a, as a source for uh, filling out stuff you need to do like uh, biosketches. And finally, we have our, our longer workshop. This is We've done it in a couple hours, but it's you know it's best if you've got uh, four or five hours um, to really go through all the details and the the, the, the fanciness you can get um, with reproduce school reports and R Studio and R Markdown. And I'm actually once I go through and telling you about this, I'm actually going to do a little mini teeny tiny demo of this so you get a flavor of why this workshop is is cool. So we start off with the concept of what are reproduce school reports, right? How can we uh, from that motivation, go from something that's static PDF to something that's more dynamic and interesting and reproducible. Um, how can our studio and knitter help us generate these? Um, how we can format our documents in Markdown so they can be used in multiple different systems. Um, adding different types of uh, sections to our document, um, doing theming, adding in specific code. And the benefit here is you can add in code that will execute. And so you can actually do your analysis 
in your paper live. And I'll demo that. Um, we also go over things that are important for scientific writing, like putting in references, adding in multiple documents, formatting stuff, uh, equations, with math formatting, um, automating how you can do bibliographies, making things really interactive with like little search boxes um, and parameters. So you can actually really do these things uh, re reproducibly. And we also go over adding data from an external source. Um, so you can pull stuff in from your ORCID profile directly into your report. Finally, we go on options for publishing, making it easy to share out your work and make sure it's as reproducible and reusable for other people as possible. Okay, so now I'm gonna take a little bit of time um, to do a demo. So I'm gonna bring up um, an RStudio instance here. So this is our studio. This is what we use um, for this workshop. And it's a nice integrated um, engine for writing a, a reproducible report. So we start folks off with um, some example text. Um, so this is a kind of made up data management plan for a fictional project. Um, it's probably something one could actually do, but we're not actually doing it. And we start with just the text, right? So the workshop is, you know, it's not a writing workshop itself. It's really a, how do we take our words and format them and make them usable? Um, so what we do is um, basically go through the, we start with the kind of markdown formatting. And this is basically, as you see here, we take our plain text and we add in different types of symbols that indicate things. So these pound signs are headers. So they indicate that this is a header, this is a header, and then this will be a subheader. So there's all these types of different formatting options you can do just with your keyboard. Um, and then we can say, our studio, please show me what this document now looks like. And it's now added in these and formatted those as headers. So let's say, okay, we've got this project description. Now I can look at this document and say, eh, I'd really like this to be a header as well. So you can go back you can add in this formatting. And then when we say, please render this, let's take a look at this document. It's now applied that format. Um, so this is kind of the, 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 the basic skill set for writing one of these reproducible reports is doing all the types of formatting that we'd want to do um, in the document itself as we're writing. And so this is kind of what it looks like after they finish this first step. So it includes, so we teach things like headers, um, italics here, links and to be able to format those links nicely, um, to be able to do block quotes. That's what a standard block quote looks like. Uh, this is how you can do an image and embed an image into a document. Um, you can do kind of bold faced with that. Uh, we can do footnotes here. That's a footnote. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? And we can do tables. I'll get to that in a little bit. This is how you can format bullets. So it formats it in a nice bulleted list. This is the standard markdown tables. There are actually better options for this um, in our studio, but if you want to do a traditional markdown table, that's a traditional markdown table. And when we knit this, what we get is now a fully, doc, a fully formatted document with all the kind of basic types of formatting that you typically apply in, in Word, right? And it looks, it looks pretty, right? We've got you know, nice formatted block codes, everything in terms of the structure of the document behaves kind of as we'd expect. Okay, so that's one of the benefits of the mark, markdown. Um, and this is generally applicable. You can put this into GitHub and GitHub will understand what you want to do with it in terms of formatting. You can put the stuff into a Jupyter notebook and uh, Jupyter will understand how you want it to format uh, Markdown. Even though it's not officially a standard, um, it's relatively standardized around um, how you can tell a computer to, to format text in a, in a nice, easy, clean, understandable way. Okay, so that's the basic format. But really the, the, the main benefit that we want to share to researchers is how you can actually make this stuff reproducible and how you can start to put um, your actual data analysis into your paper itself. So we go on to um, some more advanced examples where we really make this uh, document fun. So this here in this document is it's what's called a code chunk. So what you're saying is this is actually not text. Uh, this is actually our code that's gonna do some data analysis. In this case, it's reading in a CSV file um, and then it's going to, um, make us a little plot. Um, and this could be any sort of data analysis that you wanted to do. It could be in R, it could be in Python, um, uh, and you can make this as complicated as you want. We're doing you know, fairly basic examples here because we don't, 
the, the, the workshop is not about our programming. It's kind of assuming that you've already done some R or you've already done some Python and you want to figure out, okay, how can I put this into a report? The magic here is when I hit this button to knit, it's now going to go ahead. Uh, yeah, that's a running surprise. Don't look at that. Okay. Um, so when I go ahead and this button to render this report, what's happened is it's gone through and it's actually gone and taken the data and plotted it. And it redoes this every single time that I hit render. So if the underlying data changes, if I change how I want to do my analysis, your paper automatically updates with the latest version. Um, so it makes it really easy for you know, other people to now say, okay, where is this figure coming from? Uh, well, it's coming from the DOAJ seal, that's the SV file, and it has this format. And I could have done more actual data analysis here, and then I could actually look at that. Um, so this is really, uh, I think, the key benefit of these types of reproducible reports is you can have your code, you can have your data analysis, and then drop it into a paper um, without having to like copy and paste stuff from Word or from a plotting library. This version has a lot of other features that I'd like to point out. So it's got uh, an interactive legend over here. So we can go through and have, look at all the sections and their subsections. Um, we've got um, math. So um, now under the hood, this actually uses LaTeX for formatting. So you can drop any LaTeX uh, math expression uh, into this notebook, um, or in this case, into a sub, sub document, and it will nicely format and behave uh, like you want you want math formulas to behave. Um, so this is a really nice feature that 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 makes it really easy to do kind of scientific writing in this type of environment. Um, the other thing that's really used to know, I, I mentioned or was discussing before, how this is nice because we're including code in our work. And there's actually an option to actually have the code itself be available in this version of the work. You can say, please show me what code generated this data. You hit a little button and it drops down, okay, this is exactly what code generated this data. So if you want somebody to actually see in the same environment, you can just hit a little button, get the code. So you can get some really nice kind of dynamic uh, behavior in here. Um, and there's also, um, uh, as is critical for uh, scientific writing, there's a reference list that gets automatically formatted with the same uh, standard uh, formatting styles that you'd expect. Um, and these automatically get populated and cross-linked, so on and so forth. So that all behaves um, as you'd expect for a scientific writing environment. Um, this is all um, completely formatable. So this is, a, this is all basically in HTML. Um, so you can then apply custom themes to change how this looks. And I'll just demonstrate this quickly. Let me go ahead and change the theme. Now I can re-render this and it completely changes how the, the our document looks. Right, we've got different fonts, we've got different styles, we've got different sizes, different colors. Um, so you can e really easily customize and change how your document looks without having to go in and change any of the actual formatting of the document itself. Um, anything like that. So it's really flexible and you can very easily customize this with, with CSS. So if you want to get really finicky and change it, change all the, all the formatting, you can go ahead and do that. The other really cool feature is you can knit this to other formats. So let's say somebody needs this in a PDF. Um, if you've got a local LaTeX install, you can generate a nicely formatted PDF um, with, um, yeah, that is, this is basically all LaTeX. Um, and I did not actually have to write any LaTeX. All I had to do was write in Markdown and then hit a button and it gives me a LaTeX formatted uh, PDF with all my plots, the live rendered, um, and all my tables and all that type of stuff. You can also do this to Word. Um, so if you need a Word document for some reason, you can go and take the exact same source and generate out a data management plan in Word with a uh, you know, nicely cross-linked uh, Word uh, biography with all the images and uh, graphs that you generated, as well as the math equations. I don't know what, um, under the hood, our, our studio uses some Pandoc for this rendering. I don't know what Blackmagic Pandoc has so that this shows up correctly in Word with the right math formatting, um, but it does, it just works. Um, so that's really cool. So you can basically take one document, get out, um, uh, get out a HTML version that's really nice and interactive, get out a PDF version, and you can get out a Word document version. There's other options. You can do slides this way if you want to have an interactive slide deck. It's not as one-click magical because 
you don't want to put your Word document as slides. You know, you want to kind of customize the slides a bit more. Um, but you can also do slides this way. So that's um, really some of the benefits of these types of reproducible reporting is you can just write once and use many different ways. Um, and let's take a look at the, the, the most fancy version, what we end this workshop on um, is something that has a lot more interactivity and a lot more customizability in it. So in this example now, what we're doing is we're going out to ORCID and say, okay, please get me the, um, the bio section of my ORCID and drop that in live. So now when I render this, this goes out and talks to Orkin and says, okay, what is Tom's biography at the moment? It then drops that right into the biography section that I have at the end. Um, so this is live. So if I went to Orchid and changed my bio, um, then I can hit the render button again here, and this will automatically update to whatever is in Orchid. And you can do this with any of the fields that are in, in your Orchid profile. Um, so this again highlights the the benefit of doing this stuff in a kind of reproducible environment because you can then really quickly update stuff. Um, the other one of the other nice features you can include in an HTML version are, are widgets. Um, so this is an example of looking at this DOIJ seal CSV file in an interactive fashion. Um, so this has now search, so I can look for a specific country or a specific continent. Sorry. Um, let's do South Africa. You can search um, free text by any of these fields. You can also take that data and export it out as a CSV or a PDF. So it is a really nice way of looking and viewing um, the data. Um, what else did I want to share with you? Oh, yes, the other cool thing that we, we talk about in this workshop um, is um, something called knitting with parameters. So um, what you can do in this knitting, in this generating step, is you can change things about your report. So you can say, okay, what type of what type of field do I want to put in here? I can put in text for let's say the institution. And then you can also control things like the plotting. So let's say you wanted to be able to say whether the plot included journals that charge a fee or that didn't charge a fee. You can select that option and then hit knit. And now it'll render out a version of the report that has those parameters um, in it. So up here at the top, We've now changed the affiliation. And now we have a plot down here that only includes the DOAJCL journals that have a, that have a fee associated with them. Um, similarly, I can now rerun this with parameters and say, no, I, I don't want to do that. I want to have all the DOAJ journals. I can rerun this processing. And we now get a different graph that has all of the journals in it. Um, so you can really do very fancy reports um, that have kind of flexibility when you generate them. You can say, okay, what type of things do I want in this report? And then it'll generate for you. So that's what we go for in this workshop. It goes, starts with basically just some text. And in the end, we've got a really nice dynamic reproducible report that the researchers can take home and hopefully build off of. Okay, so what else do we have? What are the next steps for author carpentry? So we've got a future roadmap with learning objectives set out for, for a large number of um, lessons. So um, more authorship work, some scholarly reputation, attribution, bibliographies, some LaTeX, Creative Commons, reputable open access journals, um, XML, some stuff, Zotero, uh, and reference management. So these all have um, a basic structure of what types of things we put in the course, but they haven't been fully fleshed out. We're also accepting additional ideas um, at our planning repo. So if you've got something that you think really people would want as an author carpentry workshop, you can feel free to suggest that. Um, and the last thing I wanna make clear is, you know, this is an open project. Um, so if you'd like to be involved, we, we'd love to have you. Um, so all of our lessons are openly available online. So if you go back to the links, you'll see that they're all on GitHub. So you can go in and say, make pull requests. I guarantee there are typos in all of our lessons. Um, so if you want to find them and fix them for us, that would be wonderful. Um, we do have contributing guidelines up. Um, if you'd like to render them locally, it gives you a, a brief setup for how you install stuff on your local machine so you can render out um, the HTML versions of the lessons. Um, and we're also gonna be doing an open planning meeting on January 10th uh, at 10 a.m. Pacific. So you can go ahead and, and register for this. <coughs> Feel free to join us and we'll have a, a longer, more in-depth discussion about where the community thinks all the carpentry should go. And I'll make sure that that link gets dropped into the chat as well. Um, so with that, 
we've got a little bit of time for questions. Um, so you can always check out our website, um, Author Carpentries on Twitter, and then I'm also on Twitter, and also feel free to send me an email. I'd be very happy to help. Um, so feel free, um, either drop questions into the chat um, or uh, unmute and ask your question live. Thank you very much for this, Tom. Um, if, if I might have the, the first question, please. Of course. Um, so um, can, can you say a little bit about who has been most interested, like who your attendees have been when you've, when you've given the, the author carpentry workshops? I think we've had the most interest on the author carpentry workshops from grad students and postdocs. Um, I think they're um, most interested in uh, new types of new types of authorship and new types of, of communication. Um, and the you know the, the one challenge with kind of open publishing is um, you know the the kind of traditional journals. Oh, thank you, David, for putting that in there. Um, the traditional journals are so entrenched in how um, you know scientific assessment gets done, and you know what scientists see as the value of their careers. Um, you know they'll even look at uh, some of these kind of reporting and automation features as you know something they can use in lab for like putting together lab meetings um, and just reporting stuff in the group because that's like lower stakes and less kind of career dependent. And so you know, so the hope is that if we get um, you know, more researchers trained up in these techniques, um, then we can start branching out and say, well, okay, if we're doing these for kind of lab reports um, or for, uh, you know, uh, stuff that we're sending back to the PI, can we do that for the actual main paper? Um, so that's kind of the, the, the concept, whether it will work or not, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think the, the, most, of the most of the interest has been from grad students postdocs. Yeah, and so Carmen was also asking in the chat about the the turnout for the author carpentry workshops. How, how does that compare to like the the software and data carpentry workshops that you've done at Caltech? Well, so the the software and data carpentry workshops are always a hundred percent oversubscribed. <laughs> um, so there is always an incredible amount of demand for the software and data carpentry workshops. Um, the author carpentry workshops that we've run, um, we've also gotten very good attendance for, um, but it's because they're not as like, researchers generally know, I, I really should know Python, right? So somebody's telling me I really should learn Python. Um, whereas the author carpentry stuff, because it is new, it's not as well known, um, there's, you, you do have to do a little bit more outreach, but we've, we've still seen a lot of interest. Right. So we do have a, a, now there are there are some more there are some I, more yeah, questions. I, I, just, in the I chat. just saw there's there's another good question in the chat about um, accessibility, and I haven't done um, an assessment on the screen reader ability of the reports, um, but they are all standard HTML, and they've got um, you've got a lot of mark uh, markup kind of inherent in the way that you're doing the formatting. So you've got kind of alt text in the images. Uh, Kind of built into how you structure the images, um, so it's it would be it, it is a hundred percent worth investigating more, um, but it I, I think it has because it's kind of built on the base level on HTML. Um, I think it 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 has a much better shot of being screen readable than a lot of other kind of web type properties. And do you want to speculate at all about? where in the world these workshops have taken place and why there are some gaps? Specific. Oh, um, yeah, so carpentry is broadly, um, you know, I think there's, so what you see in terms of that, that world map that I showed are only the workshops that have registered with uh, the main carpentries organization. You know, I think that there, I think there are workshops happening in other places. Um, that just don't get reported back to the main carpentries organization. Um, and I know the carpentries are doing a lot of work as an organization to make um, workshops more accessible uh, across the world. Um, so they're really working kind of with specific geographic coordinators um, to figure out what regions need uh, to be able to bring these workshops. Um, and you know, one, the one thing that the pandemic has shown is that online workshops are here to stay. And that makes it way easier 
um, to be able to bring workshops to more global locations. I mean, there's there's issues with internet access. There's there's still challenges, um, but compared to kind of previously where the the main workshop format was all in person and you would need to fly people across the world in order to run these workshops, um, you know now you can uh, basically have online workshops um, that don't involve so much travel. So. Um, it's something that Carpentry is broadly is really working on and making the workshops more accessible. Um, but it's also, it's, it's hard to know um, how broadly the curriculum has dispersed. Um, the other thing that's related to this Carpentry are working on are translations and figuring out how to um, translate the, the workshop content into different languages. And there, there are some languages that are live and there's some they're still working on. Um, but that's another aspect of this that um, the Carpentry is broadly are, are attacking. Um, and somebody mentioned um, that they that they were looking for the recording of this meeting, um, and uh, it will be posted up on the uh, on the on the YouTube channel for for this for the Flow group. Um, and I think we'll also probably uh, send out an email to everybody who registered um, once that's been posted, uh, because we've got your registration. So we'll we'll send you an email with that link once it's available. So please do uh, if you're interested in seeing uh, how you might want to work about the carpentry. Uh, feel free to join our planning meeting in January. We'd be very glad to have you. Um, otherwise, um, you know, just feel free to look at the website. And if you want to teach this content, please do. It's a, it's an open curriculum, and we're we're very excited for, for for other folks to use it. So, on behalf of the IFLA STL um, Professional Development Subcommittee, um, I'd like to echo the the thanks that are popping up in the chat. Thank you very much for taking the time. Um, to put together this webinar and share with us the work that's been going on around author carpentry. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day.